about institutional frameworks for faecal sludge management. Let's start by looking at the sanitation services chain. In the top of the diagram, you can see the household toilet on the left-hand side, moving through the collection removal of waste, the transport or conveyance to the treatment, and then disposal or reuse. There are several ways in which this chain can be achieved satisfactorily. Perhaps the best understood is the use of a sewage system and a sewage treatment facility. This requires a network of pipes and pumping stations to convey the waste from the household to the treatment and disposal site. But less well understood is faecal sludge management. Typically this involves the storage of the human waste at the household, either in a pit or a tank, and then the periodic removal of waste by manual means or pumps and transportation by a vehicle or a cart to a treatment site. When the service is done manually or with a very small vehicle, then a transfer station can also be part of the chain. Another common option that's found in lower density urban or rural situations is that a full pit is covered over and the waste is buried on site and then a new pit is dug. As long as the groundwater, groundwater is several metres below the base of the pit and there are no other adverse ground conditions, this could be a safe disposal option for those who have space on their site. The conventional focus of institutional arrangements, regulation and finance in most countries has been the sewerage services. To date, faecal sludge management has largely been neglected. What this means in practice is that there is little or no regulation, that there are rarely any mandated and legally responsible institutions, and consequently there is little or no finance available. The private sector has stepped into this situation, partially, but we'll talk more about that later. In practice, things often look a bit different than they do in our nice little theories. And this is an example from Maputo. This is a fecal waste flow diagram which basically depicts how the waste from a certain proportion of the population is dealt with. Um, and the width of the arrows is proportional to the proportion of the population using that particular service chain. And what we see here <coughs> is Fecal sludge management is definitely the big part of the service chain which is missing. 38% of the waste is escaping into the environment because of inadequate fecal sludge management. But we also see that at the front end of the chain um, there's a little bit of open defecation and uh, there's also some rather unsatisfactory sanitation facilities, particularly in low-cost rental housing. We also see that the sewage system is also actually not functioning particularly well. Only about a third of what goes into the sewage system actually is, is properly treated at the other end. The rest leaks out or is, or is not properly treated. Um, and then we see that actually the, the biggest chunk of all is those toilets of the sort of more rural type which are just covered over and, and, and filled in. So this gives us a key to what our priorities are. So why is fecal sludge management so important? Firstly, most urban dwellers in developing countries use on-site sanitation. This is the rich and the poor alike. For example, in Africa, less than 10% of the total of urban population in Africa has access to a sewer. And virtually all poor people, not only in Africa, use on-site sanitation. That is, if they have access to sanitation at all, uh, still many people are open defecating. And that on-site sanitation is very rarely managed as an integrated system, including the transport and treatment, as we have seen in the sanitation service chain. And this is resulting in huge public health risks, but also major environmental pollution. On the right hand side, you'll see a plot of access to improved sanitation by wealth quintile. 
And what's interesting about this diagram is even in countries that have achieved almost 100% access for the rich, in many cases, in all cases, there is still very poor, very limited access to improved sanitation for the poor. Slightly better situation in Paraguay, but if you look in India, while the richest people have access to um, high levels of sanitation, of improved sanitation, um, the poorest people are still under 20%, um, have under 20% access. Another interesting feature of this diagram is that the uh, proportion of services of access to um, improved sanitation varies a great deal from country to country according to wealth. If you look at Sierra Leone, the lines for Sierra Leone and Ghana, the purple and black ones, you'll see that um, 80%, more than 80% of the population still are using unimproved sanitation or have no access to sanitation at all. Those, those lines um, vary a great deal. As we've said, sanitation is a chain of services and we'd like to look at how these services are delivered. At the front end of the chain, we have toilets and so people need to have them built, they need to buy the components, they need people to build them. They may in some sense, in some cases, use public toilets if they can't build one for themselves. When on-site systems, which are serving most people, are full, they need the sludging. Further down the service chain, we find treatment of, 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 of that sludge, and we find uh, things like management of sewage, drainage, and solid waste. Um, if we go back and look at those services at the front end of the chain, these are basically private goods which individual customers would be happy to buy for themselves, a new toilet or to get their toilet emptied when it's, when it's full. Conversely, at the bottom end of the chain, these are public services, typically supported by infrastructure, such as treatment plants, uh, which are public goods and therefore need to be paid for by some kind of public finance because people will not pay for them individually. We're now going to give four examples. Mm. The first two examples are well-developed examples where the chain is functioning effectively and the second two are examples of where we're working and the situation is still developing. First of all, we're going to look at Malaysia where they have a national wastewater utility called Indo Water Corporation, which means beautiful water. The, uh, the, the diagram you see in front of you actually it sh shows how the chain works, both for urban and rural situations. In the blue, line, in the blue, blue oval, um, you can see the urban part of the service chain. And within that, they have a conventional piped system of, for sewage collection and treatment, and they have a fecal sludge management service, which, um, which serves serves septic tank um, systems, um, transports that waste to, uh, uh, to treatment and disposal. Here's another example. This is the municipality of Etiquidi, formerly known as Durban in South Africa. Um, this is a it looks a bit like utility, but it's actually a municipal department, part of the municipality of, De of, of Etiquini. And as you see, they offer a whole range of services which, which cover both sewerage, on-site systems, um, <coughs> water recycling, water supply. Um, and as you see here, this is directly from their website. Um, there's, there's no particular hierarchy of sewerage or, or, or on-site systems coming first. This is just all the different things which, which they do. And they provide a complete service to all of the citizens of Etiquini. Um, so moving on to the examples, uh, the more developing situations. Um, I've been working in Indonesia for a few years on fecal sludge management. And one of the first things we did there was to look at a number of cities and look at the management uh, arrangements, the institutional frameworks for fecal sludge management. Um, 
We found quite a lot of different models. Most of them were dysfunctional in some way or other, but they varied. So actually where a city, um, how a city could move forward and improve that situation varied depending on what the starting point was. And we categorized the situations we found into this ladder of six options. There was a definite hierarchy that some models were better than others. And then we established a series of recommendations that depending where you are on the ladder, that you can follow to move up the ladder. Ideally, we want the cities to move several steps, several rungs up the ladder at one step, but we're beginning to realize as we work on this, it depends on the buy-in from the city decision makers and the prioritization that they're putting onto fecal sludge management. And where that's high, we're finding that they can move quite quickly up the ladder, jumping several steps. But where there is a lower buy-in and a lower interest, it's one step at a time. So they make that decision themselves where they are and how they move forward. Across the world in Maputo, where I work at present, um, we have a, a situation where the, the municipal council is under law responsible for sanitation services in the town. What is the actual situation? We have private sector providers, and that's the vast majority, uh, providing tankering services and, and manual emptying services and also all the services of, of latrine construction and so on. We have <coughs> very limited public services which are managed directly by the Municipal Council and we have quite a few NGOs and other different partners also providing services. Those require coordination with the other things that are going on and sometimes that's not very effective. The municipality as responsible for sanitation obviously needs to monitor what's going on and to promote uh, improved services and improved behaviour. The municipality is not alone in all of this, so we have a regulator which is in charge of regulating water and sanitation services. We have a government agency which is the Water and Sanitation Infrastructure Board, known as IAS under its Portuguese acronym, which provides technical assistance and capacity building. And we have the National Directorate of Water, which is part of the Ministry of, of Works and Housing, which is responsible for policy and strategy and, and legislation within which the Municipal Council does its job. So this is what's supposed to happen, but in fact, many of these things are still being developed and what we see is a moderately weak municipal council struggling to provide some services with the private sector basically filling in as best it can but in an unregulated and uncontrolled way and possibly with some NGOs also assisting. So one of the, um, so the message so far is that you have to start developing the institutional framework based on what you have and this can vary quite a lot within a country and certainly between countries. So a proposal, so, so we, we have developed a framework for how to make that assessment. Uh, the framework starts off with three core pillars, the enabling pillar, the developing pillar and the sustaining pillar. In the enabling pillar we look at the policy, the planning and the budget situation and developing we look at the expenditure in the sector, the equity of that expenditure, and the actual output achieved from the expenditure, and the sustaining, looking at the maintenance of the system, the expansion and the user outcomes. And we look at those components across the entire sanitation chain, a component by component. And we do that not on ourselves, not by ourselves or with consultants, but as a participatory process. And that participatory process would typically include the line ministries, the Ministry of Public Works, the Municipal Council, the Health Department, but also central planning ministries, um, the uh, Finance Department, the Treasury, um, any regulators if they exist, quite likely to include some academic partners, NGOs, CBOs, community-based organisations, everyone who has an interest and a stake in the sector. So together, they would establish um, so a sort of traffic light system. Now each uh, building block under the pillar, so that's under policy, you have certain key questions. And each question is assigned a mark 
zero, half or one and those marks are added up and depending on the score in the country you, you get a visual uh, a visual image of the status of the situation. Here we have a service delivery assessment from Kampala and what we see there in the top left hand corner that there is a clear policy on containment at the household level and this is quite a common situation to find. As you go across the chain um, there is a framework there. The yellow indicates a sort of intermediate mark where there is something there. Maybe it's there in paper, but it's not operationalized or it's partial. Where you see a red mark, a zero or a half, there is either nothing there or it's very weak um, and inadequate in some way or another. So by looking at this framework, uh, you can see what are the priorities, what needs to be done, what's missing, and where you have something to build on. So we, did, we undertook this exercise in a number of cities across the world and here are some of the examples of what we got out of it. Um, here we've summarised under those three main pillars <coughs> uh, the, the general status in, in a number of, of different cities and we have tried to categorise them into those where basically it's, it's a general disaster and, and really nothing much is happening at all. Then those where we call it basic, where the authorities are, are taking a serious action, there is some framework, but it's still a very weak framework. And then the improving situation where things have gone a bit further and the framework is really coming to life. And finally we compared it with, with the situation with, with Indo Water in, in Malaysia, which has a, a very good and effective system. So we'll now give two examples, one worse one and one better one. So here is the service delivery framework for fecal sludge management in Dakar in Bangladesh. What you see, similar to the Kampala example, there is something um, there on policy for containment at the household level. So they have that bit in place. The rest of the um, chain, the service delivery chain through the three pillars, is very weak, zero or half. If you look at the bottom pillar, the sustaining pillar, you see some half scores there. And that's because there is there are manual emptiers available and so some emptying can be done and is done on as and when needed, but it's a very unsatisfactory, unhygienic, uh, unsafe system. But the users can achieve some outcomes, although these are minimal. Now this is the institutional framework. What does this look like in practice? So we will now look at the um, sh uh, ship flow diagram for Dakar in Bangladesh. So we have around 20% of the population with a flush toilet to a sewer and around just under 80% using some form of on-site facility and a low number, 1%, who are open defecators. But of those on-site facilities, um, a very large percentage, around 70% uh, of them, are flowing directly into the environment or uh, abandoned and people aren't using them. As we go across the chain, what we see also is that there's some emptying, mostly unsafe and unclear and it, um, unsafe and um, illegal and, it's, uh, and that has been disposed, the waste has been disposed directly into the drainage system and removed in that way and other emptying is done safely, but the disposal of that is illegal. Of the sewer system, uh, there's a considerable amount of leakage, and of the waste that reaches the treatment plant, um, around half of that is not treated effectively. So the end result of this is that 98% of the waste in Dhaka goes into the environment, and only 2% is treated. And perhaps a significant part of this is also to see that the poorer population are using the on-site facility and the waste is draining into the local area and the immediate environment, whereas those who have a higher level of toilet service and have access to a sewer, their waste is being taken further away from the household. Moving across to Dakar in Senegal, in West Africa, not to be confused with Dakar in Bangladesh, we see a much stronger framework in place under the National Sanitation Utility, ONAS, 
and with the assistance of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who have been working with them for the last five years or so. What we see certainly under the enabling pillar, it's, it's all pretty strong. Plans are, are good, the policy is, is strong, and some money is, is going into the system. Slightly weaker under the developing and sustaining pillars, but there is a framework and it's, it's gradually coming together. If we look uh, under the sustaining pillar, at the time this assessment was made, um, the treatment plants were not working very well, they weren't being properly looked after, and the result in terms of disposal was pretty awful because there was a lot of pollution going on. Since that uh, assessment was made, the private sector has taken over the treatment plants in a public-private partnership, and indeed it looks as though they're working a lot better. So actually if we were to look at this today, we'd see a lot less red than we have here. In terms of the fecal waste flow diagram, <coughs> we see a not dissimilar situation to back in Bangladesh where about a quarter are connected to sewers and about three quarters have an on-site facility with a small number of open defecators. Again, <coughs> we have a big issue here with uh, unsafe emptying so that almost a 30% uh, of the total waste in the, in the city is, is being unsafely emptied. We're seeing quite a lot of safe collection, of which perhaps um, one third is illegally dumped and about two thirds is legally dumped. And then we're seeing partially effective treatment. And the overall result is just over 30% of the waste is properly managed, but still just under 70% is, is not properly managed yet. Moving on to see how these sanitary services interact with public health, um, we have here down the left side the, uh, the abbreviated version of the service chain. If we look at how that translates into uh, disease, uh, where we have dirty toilets or unsafe emptying practices or leaky sewers or uh, poorly functioning drainage system or contaminated water getting onto fruits and vegetables all of these things can lead to transmission of fecal pollution and to disease this also interacts with the water system so that in those cities where people are using wells uh, which are polluted by their toilets this can also be a, a route of disease transmission as can inadequate quantities of water for personal hygiene. Unfortunately, we need to look even beyond water supply and, and, and sanitation services because poor solid waste management, as we know, ends up blocking up drainage systems. And also, uncontrolled or poorly controlled land use can greatly exacerbate drainage problems and, and frequently do in fact in, in, in many towns and cities and so the issue with, with drainage and, and malfunctioning sewers just becomes magnified and causes more and more problems so we need in addition to decent proper sanitation services effective drainage effective solid waste management and effective urban planning because if we don't get them what we do with sanitation is going to be a waste of time. If we look at these different services, which we would <coughs> like to see working in, in parallel, here we have them, solid waste management all the way to landfill, stormwater into the drainage system, um, and uh, the sanitation service chains, supported by effective physical planning, uh, proper land use control and uh, possibly slum upgrading we would like in future to see more recycling going on of, of the end products of, of the sanitation chain so this is the ideal situation of course in practice things are not quite that good we're getting cross connection almost everywhere into the drainage system from sanitation systems we're getting solid waste going into the drainage system so that's giving us pollution downstream and it's, it's giving us flooding. And when we get flooding, then we get issues with our treatment works, sometimes our sanitary landfills, 
also getting flooded and the whole system breaks down so putting this all together what, what do we have? we have a whole series of services that need to be provided some of these are as we've said before private goods, the customer services buying my toilet uh, emptying it, using public toilet some of these are public services typically treatment uh, operation of the different drainage and sewage and solid waste services and those services in turn are supported by infrastructure uh, which is public as we said before the private goods typically provided by the private sector and the public goods typically provided by the public sector the services somewhere in between and very often these can be effectively provided through public-private partnerships but this depends on the case in some places they may be more public in others they may be more private as we've also said the role of local government is, is critical in this because even if you have a utility there's a lot of coordination and planning legislation, enforcement and promotion and so on that has to go on which uh, only a, a, a governance institution can provide and that local government is supported typically from the national level by things like policy uh, regulatory framework capacity building uh, and then planning uh, financing and, and monitoring of, of the way that money is spent so that we can see these services being properly delivered. So, we hope you don't forget this presentation, but if you do, please remember these points. First of all, um, effective sanitation needs to be a series of interconnected services that need to function all day and every day. They can only be, and they will only be, um, delivered by um, motivated people who are working in institutions that have very clear mandates, roles and responsibilities. That needs to be very clear for them to function and that those um, institutions um, cover the entire service delivery chain. And the institutions need to be clearly accountable and held to account. Um, planning, budgeting and monitoring are essential elements of this accountability and sustainability and they need to be they need to function as a feedback loop so that um, deficiencies and problems can be um, remedied. The SFD, the Fecal Waste Flow Diagram, and other diagnostic tools like the Service Delivery Assessment are very useful ways to simply um, to assess the situation and to have a dialogue between stakeholders to together prioritise and focus where interventions are needed. You should never assume any particular solution, whether that's sewerage or whether it's fecal sludge uh, management for everybody before you have actually looked at the current challenges and you've come up with the plausible future scenarios. And in almost all situations, a mix of service types of sewerage, fecal waste, fecal, fecal waste management are likely to be needed. FSM needs to be formally delivered, it needs to be regulated and it needs to be city wide. It is not a service that's only needed by poor people or poor communities and it needs to be explicitly recognised in bylaws and regulations at the city level and that needs to be reflected at the national level. And finally, national policies and plans, funding, reporting can be a very useful support for implementation at scale. So we've really enjoyed sharing our experiences and our thoughts on this subject. Um, it's certainly a subject that is having a great, more, a great deal more attention. We are very enthusiastic about it and we hope that what we've shared today uh, will enthuse you and that you will join with us and many others in working with, in this very badly needed developing subsector. Adding to, to what Isabel said, I certainly never imagined 40 years ago that, that I would be sitting in Maputo talking about fecal waste management. Um, but I'm extremely happy that I, I have. Uh, it's, this is a fascinating area to work in. It's very important. It's receiving increasing recognition. 
and there are still a lot of challenges. You know, we can get to Mars, but we still don't know how to empty pit the trees. And I hope that you will be as enthusiastic about this as, as we have been and, and will take this on to the next level.